leadership in selecting a theme, then I think Italian geographers would win this medal. So, thank you. Uh, on the theme of leadership, um, I think that Rector Rizzuto's uh, point about remembering and reviving um, that the notion of third mission has a very long history, it's as old in some ways as the history of universities, um, is a very appropriate challenge and starting point for us. I would like to say thank you also for uh, working in a second language, most of you this morning. If at any point you find we are talking too quickly, that is a bad uh, situation for both of us. So please raise your hand, draw our attention, and we will slow down. But also, if there is a point you would like to have explained in Italian, then we're fortunate to have the assistance of Chiara today, who can help us in that respect. So, on with the show. Um, to give a setting to this conversation, um, some of this work has been done for us yesterday and, and this morning. But um, my starting point would be that I think there are both opportunities and responsibilities for geography particularly, because of the distinctive nature of the discipline, um, to support public conversation of complex issues. At the same time, for all the reasons that have already been discussed, universities are in a period of change. But also the experience and practice of citizenship is in change. And I don't think I need to do more than say the world is in seven types of crisis and we have a responsibility, I think, to respond. I speak as someone who came from uh, a degree in social and political sciences and I arrived in a geography department for the first time as a PhD student and uh, I don't know if this translates but I, I had uh, the experience of a conversion and I now have the dangerous enthusiasm of the convert uh, because I think it is um, a, a unique discipline for its capacity to bring together the natural and social sciences and the humanities um, to address contemporary questions. And so we describe it as a pathfinder discipline, um, constantly capable of remaking itself and of experiment, and in doing so, showing leadership in academia as a whole. So just briefly to introduce our approach in experiments that we will summarize today that stretch across 20 We argue strongly for more plural and more dynamic representations of global environmental issues. Climate change should not be considered as one big fact that needs to be somehow delivered into the hands of a waiting public. This is a complex process that will unfold over time. We need to bring together different communities of interest and experience, and there will be times when that should include people who strongly disagree. And uh, finally, we think that improvisation is an important aspect of our practice of public geography, and we would argue for that strongly in encouraging others. So, one way of summarising our experience is that just taking climate change as a case study, we find it is messiness meeting difficulty. But that doesn't mean it shouldn't be fun. Just something to say about our experiments. Obviously, we call them our experiments, but they're done always in collaboration with others. And we, we work collaboratively. We're from two different disciplines. I'm from the field of architecture, and Joe has been in geography. And these are both disciplines we feel share insights from across humanities and the social and natural sciences. But they're both concerned with space, place, and processes of change. And more recently, these disciplines are also amongst the most prominent centers of research 
in relation to global environmental change, economic and in future modes of inhabitation. And in a sense, that's why we think that improvising is a, is a really interesting way to characterize the experiments that we've been doing with others. Um, it comes from the Latin root of the word improvisus, which means unforeseen. How do we think and practice in a condition of unforeseen? So climate change is, is the context that we've been, been working in, and as Joe said, a complex issue where messiness meets difficulty. I have attempted to uh, boil down to make a reduction that summarizes the cultural politics of climate change. And I will do no more than point at these six issues. I won't um, expand on them, but I would be grateful if you think that there's one too many or you think I need to add one uh, because I'm constantly trying to refine this summary. But its characteristics uh, are unique. This combination is unique. We've not met this kind of issue before that has this characteristic of global pervasiveness combined with far-reaching uncertainty, combined with complex interdependencies, not just between the human and the non-human world, but within systems within the non-human world. I think that we cannot understand this issue or act on it without a sensitive ear for post-colonial, particularly, histories. Um, so the interdisciplinary effort, of course, includes necessarily historians. Interdisciplinary, of course. But then my last point is perhaps where all of the politics and the public conversation gets most difficult, because we have to recognize that interests and impacts uh, vary over time. There is a, a politics and an ethics of responsibility uh, and vulnerability that is constantly shifting, but is, I think, right at the core of the difficult conversations we have about climate change. And Thanks. <laughs> um, so I, I did try and summarize Joe's six dimensions of, of climate change. Climate change is to here, to there, to everywhere, too weird, too much, too big, to everything. Climate change is not a story that can be told in itself, but rather it is now the condition for any story that might be told about our inhabitation of this fractious planet. So um, again, I will only briefly uh, respond, uh, um, summarize, what I think are the, the ground conditions for academic and policy work in this field. Um, I think it is, um, I should say, I, I love my economic and psychology colleagues, but uh, I would observe that they have uh, an excessive dominance on a range of major issues, and climate change is not an exception. And I think including a belief in what in English we call uh, stealth uh, policies or nudge economics. The idea that we don't have to directly address the difficult topics, but rather we can play tricks uh, on the public, I think is a profound problem. Uh, and then there's the idea that there might be silver bullets, um, uh, magical solutions uh, to these complex issues. All of this, I think, is not an accident. It happens in the context of uh, the loss of confidence in a competent state. Um, despite the fact that uh, across the world, we wake up every morning and we see wide evidence of an effective and competent state. Um, the coincidence of uh, Reaganism and Thatcherism uh, with the emergence of climate change as an issue, I think is a very unfortunate consequence because we have lacked uh, a sense of what the state could do to show leadership. In this context, there is a hazard around public work, cultural work around climate change. And that is that it simply is a way of communicating the facts, 
you know, rather like a, a Swiss finishing school uh, for ladies uh, for uh, climate change policy, that uh, it simply eases these issues into the world. So um, our projects have been done under the fr a framework called Culture and Climate Change. Um, there's, there's a website um, where we convene different projects. There are also links to various other projects connected to, to us and um, the wider community that are working in this area. And really we, we thought about this as a response to some of the claims made about climate change by politicians, by activists, by, um, by artists, by journalists. It was the experiments and improvisations were more effective modes of thinking and practicing in a climate changed world. And what we're going to do for, for most of the talk is talk through six of the projects under the framework of culture and climate change and, um, and briefly talk, talk about some of them and talk about others in, in more detail. So, so these are the six projects that we'll just um, address one, one by one. I'm going to talk really briefly about a piece of work that I have undertaken since the mid-1990s um, that has worked directly with, uh, uh, with media decision makers, uh, program editors, uh, channel controllers of TV stations, mostly BBC. Um, the work has uh, taken four different forms. Um, in this case, of course, you might think I'm not talking about public, uh, the practice of public geographies, but I think it's worth keeping in mind uh, mediating institutions and mediating professions um, who can support uh, this work and who have often some common goals in supporting public understanding and debate. So the first of these is a long-running series of seminars um, where the methodology was incredibly simple. We, we brought together um, 20 or so media decision makers, editors and uh, channel controllers, and 20 or so experts. Um, uh, so uh, Marina, I know her work is on um, uh, the Sahel and uh, water management in the Sahel, is an example of the sort of person who would come and spend two days with uh, media decision makers. Two days later, these media decision makers have a far more sophisticated understanding of the stories they should be telling to their publics, but also, you may not need this, but the specialists would leave with a much more in intuitive understanding of what a story is. The second area of work is about consultancy in supporting uh, broadcast projects. I'll talk about one in a moment. Thirdly, the more traditional academic work of reports and commentary, but translating my academic writing into a form that could be consumed by these professionals. That act of translation is an important one in this work, and sometimes it's important to recognize that the academic isn't the person that needs to be doing that. They might need to work with a partner who has an ear tuned for a particular audience. So audience and ear and mediation and translation are all key references. Finally, we have both worked to support journalism training and uh, student learning. So um, this is uh, material from us gathering materials at the Paris Climate Conference in 2015. Um, there we're interviewing someone from the World Meteorological Organization and these materials went into um, a world first, which is an interactive map of a climate conference. So a climate conference involves tens of thousands of people, but is a very uh, difficult uh, uh, institution to read from a distance. And so this interactive map allows my open university students at the time to engage with the interviews that placed the interactions that produce a decision about climate change into a map. So essentially it was a device to help people understand how you have a meeting about climate change globally. So the important point there might be that uh, students are also a public and we might come back to that topic. 
This is just to mention, uh, this is a still from a, a BBC uh, television programme that I advised on, um, that we also was translated, if you like, for the Discovery Channel in the United States. And I think the interesting thing here was about the interaction between an academic insight and a media storytellers and, and very talented uh, designers. I won't explain what's going on beyond the fact that this was a device for helping support a more social understanding of uh, choices about climate change. So just to say the one thing that we offered in that case was um, the insight, the academic insight, that the debates about climate change needed to be understood as about social choice driven to one outcome. Uh, that this that was that made more political space and also editorially was safer for the BBC. Now Renata's going to talk about the Interdependence Day project. Um, so this this is a programme of experimental events, publications, interventions, testing different framings of sustainability and also innovating in forms of public engagement around the topic between academics, publics, creative and policy partners. And to question really what could be meant by global interdependency. And it was informed by work in human geography, the ethical and political implications of thinking space relationally, and also therefore the geographies of responsibility and also by the tradition of participation, interactivity, and co-production from architecture. So it, was, it started around 2005, and then it, it kept sort of growing from one year, two years, seven years, with, with very small incremental uh, pockets of, of funding. We did several interactive public events. There were reports co-written with um, journalists and NGOs. There was also a catalog book. Um, and in a way, the whole, the whole project, the whole program of events and interventions and publications was an unruly mix. But, you know, fundamentally it was about an invitation to think again about what making new maps might mean in a process of change. Um, and so we, we um, involved students in the project, rethinking what, what mapping might mean. Here is an example where um, of the UK being remapped in terms of its networks of resources rather than as nodes of cities, which is a kind of dominant mode of, of mapping that was exhibited in, a, in an architecture biennale. Um, we, also, we also looked at um, thinking about what a living and provisional exhibition might mean. Here was some collaborative um, stitching on a tablecloth for participants in one of our events that was a Mapa Mundi. So people came to, to the event and stitched their stories into a map of the world. And Mapa Mundi, the word comes from the word for, for tablecloth, not just map. And um, the catalogue of all of the events for the Atlas. And the book allowed just a glimpse of the different ideas, the art interventions, the expert witnessing, the stories, the journalism, all responses to global environmental change. And then, as I've said, we characterize this as an unruly mix. The idea that small gestures and practices, responses to uncertain conditions, could also be seedbeds for change. And it highlighted the value of tracings and probings of worlds which are currently in the making. A guide to journeys that open new pathways, connections that might become networks, practices that could become effective institutions, and niche experiments that might nourish purposeful change. And this led on to a, a project called Creative Climate around the same time as we were working on the Interdependence Day project. Yes, it's probably worth saying, I think this is a family of projects. They have relationships and one learns from another um, and sometimes grows out of another. Um, uh, creative Climate, can I? Um, 
Creative Climate um, responded, uh, among other things, to my situation. I was working for 17 years at um, one of the world's biggest distance learning universities. We had a partnership with the BBC, but also I anticipated that the Open University would be imaginative and uh, a leader in its relationship with social media. There is a cautionary tale embedded in this story. Um, so it started as a, a research, learning and engagement project with a, a participatory online platform. Idea, and it was partly designed in response to uh, climate contrarians, sometimes called climate deniers. Um, I don't like that phrase, but um, climate contrarians uh, and their lack of trust in academic research. And the idea behind a diary project that showed people's long journey with a difficult topic um, showed research to be dynamic and ambitious um, was partly trying to answer that lack of trust in academia. Um, but also participatory to allow people to see that you might not be able to move to a zero carbon lifestyle tomorrow morning, but you might be able across five years to uh, change your travel habits, to uh, insulate your house if you live in Northern Europe, um, and so on. So um, I should say now that those aspects of the project uh, failed more or less completely. They were a disaster. Um, and the cautionary tale here is my failure to anticipate the limitations of my own institution's appetite to engage with interactive media. Now it would be different. If I started now, it would be different. But I definitely failed to look ahead and um, plan with enough wisdom about where my institution would be. Now, in fact, the aspect of the project that worked very well was the one I was least interested in, which was to commission uh, some programmes with the World Service and the BBC World Television, which had uh, huge audiences um, across the world, not in the UK, in fact, just outside. Um, but the great thing about it um, was that they took the diary motif and the, the directors, a very good group of directors, understood um, the, uh, the, um, the device that we were trying to use. There were another, another body of um, uh, uh, media that are worth talking about, um, but I would point you just to ten um, short films that filmmakers, uh, who were student filmmakers, made. That was a partnership, um, I think a, a world first, between uh, the BBC comedy department and uh, my geography department. So you might want to uh, look at the creative climate shorts. But one of the things I learned about this is that that sense that the interactivity, uh, that potential is there in the medium. And um, it's not simply uh, that we deploy interactivity and walk away and watch it happen. I think we need to recognize that interactivity changes our practice as scholars. Perhaps we can discuss that, that more. But it was, I think, profoundly challenging to the publics we engaged with to, to acknowledge the extent of their interdependence with other parts of the world or with the non-human world. This is simply points to the resources. So again, something that I think positively came away from that project is that there were a body of resources some of the diaries we used were very effective in t as teaching materials. Actually, I hadn't really planned that, but it was a, a happy outcome. So again, in this experimental work, some of your uh, unplanned outcomes are, are rather disappointing, and some of the unplanned outcomes are just fantastic. Renata will now talk a little about uh, current work on scenarios. Um, so this is a, is a project that we launched in, in Paris at the United Nations Climate Convention on Climate Change, COP21, in December 2015. And it, had, um, it has two strands. 
Um, and it's part of a, of a series of, of projects under the framework of culture and climate change. And there will be a, a third publication called Scenarios with, with a number of different contributions in, in this series. Recordings. The second one was narratives, um, and it includes a growing network of contributors to the to the project. Um, these these are some of the names um, involved in the first two publications, and this is being constantly updating and, and added to. So the scenarios project has has two two strands really, and it's and it's still we're still in the in the middle of this project. But the, um, the first strand that I've mentioned um, was an artist residency, um, and we designed a networked residency. So we, we, we held a competition to award artists to work in the climate change network. And this was a new idea in the arts world, where residencies tend to be lodged with one institution or one individual. And our idea was that you know, a networked residency on, on climate change would mirror the distributed manner in which climate researchers work. There are tens of thousands of, of climate researchers contributing, for example, to the IPCC reports. And the other strand was simply to understand how what scenarios thinking was in various different disciplines. And this is the, this is the part which is um, ongoing work. The work obviously features um, prominently in the work of the UNFCCC, and the IPCC, but we felt that the, this sort of neglected the cultural origins of scenario work. And of course, scenarios, the term comes from the word scenari, from um, the practices of Italian street theatre, which was much later called Commedia dell'arte. But I'm thinking really about 16th century street theatre, um, which was a craft of the actor rather than the craft of the playwright. And the scenario were, were, was a framework of the actions that were pinned on the back of the canvas so that the, the, the actor could improvise with the props for the play. Um, and in a way, it was a framework for, for improvisation for, of, of the everyday and different kind of ideas of what was going on in, on, in the day, the universe. Kind of drawn into the to the kind of performances. So we challenged the artists to really think, open up thinking about climate scenarios, and we called the project collective improvisations. They were working with a range of climate researchers from different disciplines, and we were also very. It was very important to us that we, we didn't think of the artists as as again as we've said before as 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 kind of cultural um, communicators, that they would somehow turn scientific facts into um, acceptable sort of cultural information, but we wanted them to be considered as climate researchers in their own right. And we've, we borrowed the phrase we've, from, from Joseph Boyce, an artist who said, we are all artists. And so we, we in, on, in, throughout the project, um, we used the phrase, we are all climate researchers. And that extended to, to, the, to, the, to, to all the people working with, but also the larger public around climate change. Um, so through the, the four artists who, who worked with us on this project, and the work is still um, on, ongoing. Emma Critchley, who um, was working on a project with human nature, engaging with thresholds of human reach, including the deep sea, deep space. This is just one of her, her sort of planning um, diagrams where she's working with various different researchers on the, on the idea of acoustic pollution, not only as an indicator of global environmental change, but also as a powerful metaphor for climate change. Something that it's possible to be immersed in as a sort of soundscape, but also, and yet it fails on, falls on different registers. We don't quite uh, recognize what we're hearing. So she was interested in the embodied and experiential aspects of change in the non-human world, but also how this related to government, um, governance and policy and various kind of protocols and treaties about the deep sea and outer space. This is some of the images from her work and she's creating a feature length film. 
Um, Zoe Svensson was, is a director and um, of a theatre company, and she created a work. Um, this is just some of her research in public for a performance installation. She was interested in the economic and related social and cultural consequences of a climate change future. So her research in public conversations led to a performance which she called We Know Not What We Are, But Know Not What We May Be. And this is a phrase that Ophelia says in Hamlet. So that we don't yet know how we will be in the future, so perhaps we need to practice that future. Um, and this is just uh, some images from a recent, um, this is actually just last week, a performance installation in the Barbican, which, which was really a different kind of theatrical installation, which involved the audience in improvising and practicing different futures. And here are some um, actors improvising the audience contributions to redesigning London. And, and academics uh, present, academics are active contributors to those, um, it's difficult to know what to call them, performances, workshops. Um, so there's a cast that includes uh, geographers and other academics. And the, the last two artists are, are, are Theo Orman Skeeping and Lena Dobrovolska. Um, they're working on a project called Anthropocenes. And they're, they're interested in field-based research um, and they're working in with, with climate researchers in the People's Democratic Republic of Laos, in Bangladesh, and Uganda. And they've engaged with, the, with climate change adaptation in places where climate change is not, or is no longer a future scenario. Um, and they're challenging narratives, the dominant narratives of vulnerability and victimhood, and asking questions of political um, inequality among them, who decides the future and for whom. And their work is, we're working with them to make an interface, iDocs, around future scenarios that allows um, a documentary that will allow some of the research, the sort of the, the various strands of research to be very pr present in, in the medium. So often when you're making a film, you, you don't have access to all the research that goes into a film. You just, you just have the imageries and the sound and, the, and, 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 and a narrator. But but with this form of documentary, you can go into the, the research um, embedded in, in, in the project. Um, these are just a couple of images from, from the interactive documentary, some of the footage they'll be using. And moving on to Earth and Vision. So I will only fleetingly mention um, a project uh, that I love very much, uh, and I will restrain myself to just a few sentences because otherwise I would keep you all day. Um, I've been working with uh, a couple of colleagues at the Open University, uh, geographers, pathfinders of course, um, to find a path through 60 years of the BBC's environment and natural history program making. On the one hand, we want to uh, create new environmental histories with broadcasting written into them, because it's difficult normally to access this material, um, but, uh, but um, broadcasting has done a lot to shape these environmental histories. But the more important point to raise today is the work we were doing in workshops with everything from preschool children through to groups. For those that don't know, a uh, gardening group is a proxy for uh, people my age and older. Um, to explore what people might want to do if they were given uh, control over archive uh, content and, and would write their own environmental histories uh, with it. So the important point there is that if we leave this question of what broadcast archives become to the very gifted technologists, they will deliver what they think is a good idea. We were trying to have a civic conversation ahead of the specifying of what the tools are that you would use to work with uh, broadcast content. So that question of when you have a civic conversation about 
academic or public practice with, with archives is a really important uh, point for us. I, I won't uh, expand on these images more, but they reflect the fact that there are very difficult and tense um, issues raised by working with some of this material, again going back perhaps to that post-colonial point particularly. And, and perhaps this image in particular from one of the um, broadcasts, what on earth are we doing, is still um, pertinent 40 odd years later. Yeah, so the end of the world show is um, what in television terms you would call a returning strand. Um, the end of the world show has been told for 60 years, I'm afraid to say. So, stories of change. So, the Stories of Change project um, was really about prototyping energy transitions. It was a project, a multi-partner project, across many um, institutions and many disciplines, geography, architecture, history, um, um, literature, and um, it was a four-year project. Our starting point was the Climate Change Act 2008, um, which was a rewriting of the Energy Act in the UK of, of 2004, but also it also was kind of concurrent with European um, energy and climate change acts and roadmaps of, of the, that period. And it was a cross-party commitment um, in the UK, but requiring decarbonisation by 2050, uh, a fast-paced transition to change, um, to, to energy systems change, but the question was how and how could people. Um, so we wanted to open up the imaginative and political space around energy, and we worked with three different uh, locations, with three different communities in London with policy, in South Wales with communities transitioning from uh, to wind power and in what's called the English Midlands, the home, some people call it, of the Industrial Revolution, um, working with factories and in factory settings to understand how, how industry adjusts to energy change. And we, we, we brought all of these different partners, stories, collaborators um, into a, a web platform, and there's also an online publication, which again allows a glimpse of all the different to the project and the different stories that were told. And we used stories as a framing device, partly because it was a very intuitive and accessible way for people to take part. And we're just going to run through some of the um, pages from the book to give you a, a sense of some of the um, different contributions. Uh, this is just an inside cover with, with lots of um, institutions, collaborators and uh, participants. So, um, an opening event in Oxford, um, something here to be said about, um, we call it distributed energy generation. We, um, we equipped young, young Londoners, um, young people not in education or employment, with film cameras, and they were, they were interviewing policy and industry um, leaders. I think the, the, just to explain what's going on in the photograph, um, these are two pages from the book. Um, that are one of the interviews that were undertaken um, with a, a policy specialist. This is the advisor to the London Mayor about energy and climate change. And we worked with a group of young Londoners, about 20 of them, um, who, um, as Renata said, are not in education, employment or training. And we supported them to become uh, climate specialists and social scientists and uh, media specialists, all in the space of a couple of weeks. Um, and they were amazing, actually. They were incredibly responsive and quick. And one of the things that was really interesting in, um, uh, in conducting these interviews and the device they used, they designed a device um, for photo um, uh, portraits. Um, you've got an example here. So the device is that um, the individual being interviewed and photographed makes up a question, either for the present or for the future, about energy. And um, then everyone works together to take this portrait. Uh, and one of the
the things it achieves is an unsettling of who is expert and who is in control. So this energy policy expert and the young people taking the photograph are not, but it unsettles the expertise a little, just enough to build the confidence of the young people in making an interview and to build their confidence in feeling that they have a, a role and a voice and a presence in this topic. And I think that's, that unsettling and also the reversal of roles is something that we continue throughout the project in different ways. And we, we tend to bring people that wouldn't ordinarily meet together, which is a difficult task, but we did manage to achieve that. This is another um, creative writing exercise that uses some of the same techniques. Um, people were tasked with um, creating stories on, um, as an online digital writing project. We also worked in factory settings, um, interviewing and making strategies for the future with, with different factories, with employees and employers, so managing directors, but also people on the shop floor of the factory setting. Um, this, these are images from a factory that's been in continuous production since 1784. Um, some invitations, so this is an, an example of a mapping of an energy strategy done with a number of different people around a table, um, storytelling through mapping and <coughs> other interventions, and it's infographic about where the energy that supplies a, a, an industrial building comes from. You can see there's a, there's a long line that runs through 40 centimeters, um, wind power from various parts of the world. Um, working with students, again, these are, these are not the, the Londoners, these are what students in the Midlands, also using the same technique about um, ask, asking them to pose questions important to them. Um, and then various um, interventions, we created a, um, a utopian factory for a day and invited um, all of these different communities of interest into the same space to meet and talk to each other, so a managing director talking to a policy maker, talking to an artist, talking to a student at school. And then we task people to work in groups to make pamphlets about how they would, what they would imagine um, could, could be a provocation for a new kind of energy society. Um, and this is just a, another um, event in, in London around the same topics. Again, working with a map of London for, for passers-by to, to the space to create different energy solutions. I think we were nervous to use the word fun on an academic presentation slide, but I think we shouldn't underestimate the importance of fun in working to engage uh, publics, to start a journey, uh, start a conversation. That was vital in these um, street-based uh, exchanges to attract people's attention, to give them confidence uh, to engage. So, we, so we, we used the sort of headline for this project that it was about prototyping energy transitions. And we proposed that stories have the capacity to invite many more constituencies to engage in imagining change, but also consequently to have the confidence to participate. And we're just going to really wrap up because we've run out of time, so we're going to race through some of our, our insights and conclusions, and I hope we can discuss this more. Um, really sort of insights about how, how do experiments work? Um, obviously, they're unexpected processes. They bring new skills, new insights. They invite different people into new networks that you probably would have And there are always elements of surprise. There are an unruly mix. Um, they involve diverse knowledges and different stories and multiple framings that keep changing. And they're, they're polyphonies, not just in the sense of many voices, but polyphony in the music was a structure that allowed for improvisation. And of course, prototyping involves trial and error. We've spoken a little bit about some of the successes and some of the failures, but it's iterative. It's about trying again, keep trying, trying to trying to walk the talk over and over. And it should feel risky. It shouldn't feel settled. It should feel that doing something um, but Obviously, it's always about collaboration, both public and professional partners, and the integrity of co-production, so that everybody 
feels that they are involved um, in the project and somehow the project is of benefit to them. But this, these kinds of collaboration, our time became a really critical part of it, the time, what we call the time of the experiment and the economies of time because of the time that these experiments take in building trust and relationships with all the different people that need to be involved in these sorts of experiments. Our last slide, Tanya, I promise. <laughs> so, um, just to try to summarize something of what we feel we've learned and invite conversation and debate now over coffee in the evening. Um, uh, important that these experiments should be just allowed to be what they are and the, there are a range of possible outcomes. These include simply building capacity for sense making and rehearsal. They don't always result in a conclusion, they don't always result in an objective being fulfilled. Actually rehearsal is uh, sufficient if you consider the nature of some of the issues we face. I think the second point uh, speaks for itself. I just reiterate this role as pathfinder in developing new forms of exchange. That's a, a role that this discipline has played uh, a, a across uh, more than a century. And I think um, also a reminder that uh, geography will be changed by these experiences. It isn't simply a matter of uh, you know, these, these practices are vectors to publics. It's that these interactions with publics change who, who and how we are. I hope that we've showed that uh, there is some transformative potential um, of digital media particularly. Uh, there might be an opportunity in questions or over coffee uh, for me to talk about some of my ambitions as I start at the Royal Geographical Society for projects that take some of our learning and ask, what is uh, citizen geography practiced particularly through digital media? And we both want to argue for uh, the promotion of what we, we would term interactive citizenship. Uh, not an uncomplicated idea, but uh, we think there's something in it. And I think above all, you know, um, I think people would share our experience of opening the newspaper at the moment and our shoulders dropping and feeling that this is a difficult world to wake up in sometimes. But I hope we've shared some of what we, we have taken from these projects. These interactions, these collaborations are very energizing, that um, they fill us with a sense of initiative and imagination that without them we would lack and uh, this is a valuable thing to have in difficult times. We so appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. So thank you, Renata. Thank you, Joe. Very inspiring. and reflection, I think, but still stress the fact that have fun is important, so now is the moment of our coffee break. <laughs>